it, folks. Thanks for tuning in to another cruise of smooth. Hope y'all are doing okay today. Um, so, I don't quite know how to say this where it doesn't come off as potentially offensive to somebody, but just going to say it anyway. that was ridiculous. The whole situation, you know, having the guy crawl, once you get someone on the ground, that's kind of where you start to make your moves to immobilize them. So I thought that was kind of stupid. I also thought that the, the fact that he shot him while he was on his hands and knees or on his knees was stupid. He was unarmed in the fullest sense of the word. So, like, okay, if I thought someone was a threat to me for whatever reason, and I held a gun on him and got him down on the ground, and then the guy sneezes and I shoot him, I'm on the hook for murder in some degree, manslaughter, take your pick felony murder, potentially, due to the fact that it could be considered false imprisonment. Now, there was a case, uh, I don't know where, don't know when, it was a while back, the guy was sitting in his car, uh, handling some emails and stuff on his phone, he was sitting in a parking lot, and he noticed a guy walking back and forth side to side behind his car seeing his mirrors and uh, this guy jumps in and it, as soon as the guy jumps in the owner of the vehicle just reaches in grabs his gun and holds the gun on the guy gets the guy out of the car and holds him on the ground at gunpoint calls the cops the cops show up arrest the guy for attempted carjacking and that was the end of the situation so and that guy held him there. He had evidence to, you know, what had gone on. The cops fingerprint, you know, whatever.
whatever they did, but the guy got off the hook for, you know, false imprisonment because someone strange jumped into his car and tried to steal it. Well, anyway, um, you know, just because you feel threatened in any way doesn't mean that you kill somebody. Um, according to the CDC, they, there's a study put out by the CDC on firearm deaths and firearm uses. The firearm uses one doesn't get any attention. Uh, on average per year, there are north of 300, I think it's over 200,000 minimum defensive uses of firearms. Now, what that term means is, okay, I am at a place and someone is getting belligerent or aggressive with me and I don't think that I can fight them off and so I grab my gun and put my gun in their face and they stop. And you can take defensive uses of a firearm at any potential crime, uh, rape, murder, burglary, uh, assault, all sorts of things. Once someone has a gun pointed on them, they quickly change their mind about what they're getting ready to do next. Um, so, there's a lot of crimes that are prevented by someone having a gun. Now, if everybody everywhere that used a gun in a defensive manner pulled their gun and just shot every every time they shot somebody, that would be ridiculous. And we would say so. So certain cops in certain instances saying that they felt threatened, I think is ridiculous. I also think police unions are just unreasonable. Okay, I'm going to paint this in the best light possible. I am out to dinner somewhere with my wife. Her and I have gone into this restaurant. We're having us a nice dinner. Steak, potatoes, and collard greens. With sweet tea. Someone comes in to rob the restaurant. And I stand up and shoot the guy. Defensively. Or, better yet, he comes up and tries to use my wife as a hostage and I shoot the guy. Okay. Oops. Well, what's going to happen once the police show up, which they're going to get there real quick, they are going to separate me and any other witnesses and we're all going to give our stories. And the police are going to see how close they are to matching up. Granted, there's going to be different perspectives on it where they might not have seen who or what or how, but the majority of people are going to basically agree on what happened right after the fact. Well, um, police officers are given more benefit of the doubt than most civilians are when it comes to any shooting situation, whether it's justified or not. Uh, they also are allowed to meet with their union representation and calm down before they give a statement because, okay, it, unless you've taken a human life, you won't understand that level of adrenaline and anxiety and mentally screwed up. I haven't taken human life. I don't get it. But what is expected of me is a gun holder... If I use my gun in a manner that involves someone dying, whether I was justified or not, I'm expected to give a statement pretty quick after that. Before I've had a chance to calm down and unwind and get my, get my senses back about myself. Um, police officers meet with union representation in their police union. They often meet with counselors after the fact and I'm not saying that that's not appropriate I've watched a video where a cop killed a guy that was 
threatening him. And when he did, he radioed it in. All of his buddies showed up, and there's dash cam footage of this cop sobbing his eyes out on the hood of his cruiser. So, I'm not saying that the cop shouldn't have access to all that, but what's good for the prince is good for the pauper, so if, uh, if that cop gets, you know, 24 hours to go and collect himself and get his statement together, that's what I want. If I don't get it, he don't get it. So, the police are being held to a different standard and in not all cases a better one. Also, their qualified immunity is a problem. Now, I don't understand enough about that, but I think that police unions are the single biggest problem when it comes to police violence. I also think that Another problem when it comes to police violence is fatherless homes. I don't care if you're a fan of people or not. Okay, I heard a saying the other day, and this was amazing. Truth is truth. It doesn't matter if you love or hate the person that says it. Um, one thing that I think not everybody agrees on is that if a if someone reports a crime and someone matching my description is mentioned and the cops roll up because there's a vehicle matching the description and there's five tall big guys with red beards in this gas station they're going to arrest all of us and figure out what we did or didn't do Unless they've got an actual photo, if it's just matching the description of, they're going to arrest all of us and figure out what it was. They're not going to go out and arrest passing in a no-passing zone next to a blind turn. Brilliant. Um, they're not going to just go out and arrest five people and say, we got him. They're going to try to arrest five people matching the description of and go from there. So what's interesting, you always hear about the higher arrest rates of uh, minorities in any community, namely uh, black minorities. But if you look at the crime reporting, the majority of the arrest rates match up with the crime reports. So someone calls and reports, hey, I just saw someone that was so-and-so, you know, matching this description, stealing my car. Well, guess what? The cops went out and arrested someone matching that description, perhaps in a stolen car. Or a car matching the description of that car. Or the matched up plate. So, um, I think that there's a lot of just talking points and uh, phrases that can be turned into clickbait or a sound clip that we're using to have this discussion, and that's not what we need. I think we need to have actual, smart discussions that, uh, that reflect facts and current policy, current situation, and then we can go from there on what we need to do my opinion. I think that's the only way we're going to get anything lasting done. I do think that, and I've heard multiple people say this, and I've been in this opinion for a long time, I think that getting in the police should be harder, not easier. I think that it should pay more, not less. Like, okay, realistically, I thought about becoming, okay, backstory. I thought about becoming a cop six years ago. I didn't do it. It didn't pay enough. But the pet, the pay was terrible, and I had kids and a baby on the way. And I needed a better paying job than that. So I couldn't do it. I think that our cops should be paid very well.
well for their for their time and their risk in the job. I also think they should be trained way better than they are. Um, okay, take a look at most branches of the armed forces to just not necessarily to be the elite in that division, but to get in, you're, you know, you take a psych evaluation, you do basic training or boot camp for 8 to 12 weeks, but you're never granted a huge amount of authority outside of a combat zone. In most cases, de-escalation isn't a big thing. You're not dealing with U.S. citizens, so just strictly handling the situation in a manner where you and your buddies don't die is what matters. So the amount of training that you get in basic training, and you know, basic or boot camp, seems to be adequate to me because okay, well, these guys are doing this thing and we don't want to do that so we're going to go over there and break everything that they have and kill them. Okay, cool. You have been trained enough with a gun and with whatever you're using to use it. That seems fine to me. I don't particularly understand the same or less training in a more complicated job. I think most people would agree that policing is a way more complicated job than, you know, most divisions of the armed forces and most jobs of them. Granted, there are some jobs where you do need specialized training to get into them as far as, uh, you know, running radar, you know, command level jobs or appointments, um, dealing with, uh, specialized equipment, the cyber warfare units, things like that, but all that stuff that you do have to train for. I'm talking just like, okay, if you walk the first day that you're given the keys to your cop car, and the first day that you're given your gun and unit assignment, and you're sent off to war with any given combat unit, the cop's job is more complicated than yours, by and large. So, I think that the cops should receive a lot more training. And I think that the majority of the cops' training should be focused on how to handle people, specifically de-escalation tactics. You know, starting and keeping a calm situation. Like, okay, um, I've dealt with some jerk cops. I dealt with one cop but the, he literally had nothing on me because I had a broken taillight that I did not know about and I had parked.
slapped his cuffs on him, let Richard calm down, sat down, you know, done whatever he had to do. As it stands, neither one of them, they were both just kind of brawler guys. They didn't know exactly what they were doing at an expert level of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And whether it was justified or not, Richard Brooks got, Richard Brooks got shot because he had already snatched the taser. He was out of pepper spray range. He was out of baton range. They had already grappled with him a little bit. And so they kind of ran down the list of what was available to them, and that was where they were. I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I'm just saying that's kind of what happened. If those guys had been uh, jiu-jitsu black belts or brown belts or, you know, some high level of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, there's a distinct possibility Richard Brooks might still be with us. So I think that you know, extensive hand-to-hand -hand training would be fantastic for cops because if they can handle themselves, it gives them one more thing in their, or a bunch more things in their toolbox before they get down to the end and the end is the gun. At the end of the list, there's the gun. Period. So, my opinion on it, say what you want about it. Um, I think that the training time for cops should be at minimum doubled. I think that the training for cops should be ongoing. I think that the ride along period for cops should increase. You get a brand new cop, he's riding passenger seat for a long time, or he's driving, but he's got a, uh, a veteran officer with him. I think that that amount of time should increase. I think that the amount of time, from the time a cop starts his training until the time he is cut loose on his own, at minimum one year. At bare minimum. And that's like if you're screaming for manpower, you can't handle, uh, you can't handle the calls that come in, much less right traffic tickets parking tickets, whatever. If you cannot get to all your 911 calls in a timely manner and you need officers, a year minimum, in my opinion. And it should be a year of ride-along, uh, online psych training, de-escalation training, hand-to-hand uh, -hand training, on and on and on and on. So, non-lethal training, too. So, I think that I think that we are asking police, because, okay, you're asking flawed, imperfect people to carry a gun and protect more flawed, imperfect people with a month or two worth of training for a lousy salary in most places, or a lousy salary for most places. Like, okay, sure, cops in L.A. County probably get paid really good. If you look at the, you know, the nationwide average, cops in L.A. County probably get paid really good money. The cost of living there is through the roof. So the cops get paid lousy for where they live. So I think that cops should be paid more, not less. I think that cops should be constantly training. Um, you know, you see pictures rolling around on the Internet sometimes. The cops sitting running radar and he's playing on his computer, you know, surfing the web or playing solitaire or whatever. I think that should be online training time right there. I think that when you're, you know, you should have one hour paid after you get to your house at night where you can do online training time and learn de-escalation techniques So you know, practice someone over Zoom. We've already proven distance learning is a thing. I think cops would be great for them. I think that you could have one hour uh, a week where they get paid extra to go to their local martial arts academy and tumble with somebody, get good, and stay in practice. You know, suppose you hired a black belt and then his work schedule never permitted him to get back into the, the dojo. Okay, well, that doesn't do him no good. He needs to stay on the mats, tumbling, rolling, you know, keeping that craft home. So I think that more money for cops, not less, is a good thing. I think that the whole idea that we're going to disband police departments, like Minneapolis is talking about, in my opinion, one of two things is going to happen. Or one of two things.
things is going to become evident. Either we will discover that they were lying to us and they're going to do what they did in that town in New Jersey, I forget the name of it, where they disbanded the local police department, but they changed the jurisdiction and actually ended up with more cops, not less cops. So the state and county police department took over policing and patrol duties for the local police department that got disbanded. Okay? I don't have a problem with that, but don't lie to me and say we got rid of our police. And they also got more cops in that given area. So, there's all that, but you look and when you deal with a place that gets rid of its cops out and out right, all I have to say is look at Chaz or Chop or whatever they're calling themselves these days. Um, per capita their murders are high, per capita their rapes are high and per capita their violent crime is high as far as assaults and such. If people have no legal retribution to fear, they will not behave themselves. I don't think that by and large people in the autonomous zone fear the other people in the autonomous zone that did not go out and establish it. And it only proves that the most violent person rises to the top. Like you've got that warlord, Raz Simone. When you remove the police, there's a power vacuum, the most violent rise to the top. And Abracadabra. Seattle Autonomous Zone. So, I think that people are seriously kidding themselves, and even if you could find some sort of way to make it work where no, there was no uh, power struggle or no um, roving bandits uh, patrolling the city, violent crime's going to spike up all around, and uh, violent justified self-defense is going to spike up all around. Like, okay, suppose that, um, suppose pick your city and they disband their police department and they bring in no outside law enforcement to deal with the power vacuum. Okay, suppose. That's fine. Well, if you do that uh, and no, people can't call 911 to come arrest Mr. Badman, they're just going to let him break into their house, shoot him, and then call the coroner. And that's going to happen all over in that city. Or if someone comes into the convenience store, tries to rob it, they're going to take matters into their own hands and they're going to kill that guy instead of handing him the money and then calling the cops and showing him the surveillance tape. So, violent defense and violent uh, handling of small crimes is going to become a real big thing, I predict in Minneapolis if they don't bring in the outside departments such as the state or county to um, to handle the vacuum. And I hope I'm wrong. If they don't do that, I hope I'm wrong, but I bet I'm not. So anyway, I've gone on long enough. Um, tell me what y'all think. Police need more funding, less funding, more training, less training. I think that there are definitely situations where a cop isn't the go-to answer. I'll give you a case in point example. Uh, people always talk about, you know, calling out crisis workers. Okay, that's fine. Why can't you just take the less trained cop out with a crisis worker and the crisis worker say, you know, give the cop instructions where the cop's just there to protect the crisis worker but not to intervene in the situation. you got someone that's... Uh, you know, a domestic violence situation, you have a counselor come in with the cop, and the cop takes the counselor's lead unless violence breaks out. Why not? Would it work? I don't know. I'm just spouting off another idea. So, anyway, y'all stay safe. 
I've got to jump off of here. Thanks for tuning in for another Cruise with Smooth. I'll see y'all next time.